here, and I'm certain that more will be coming in as we speak and as we sing. I pray that you come prepared to meet with God today. Uh, he is meeting with us. He's a great God. He's a very patient God, and we are thankful for that. But please, please take seriously the opportunity to meet with God. Prepare your heart and have those going in. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're indeed thankful for this day. Father, for the attendance, Lord, we just pray that you lift the ones up that couldn't be here, Lord, and you just strengthen them. Father, for the ones that are here, I pray you give them special blessings in today's message that the pastor has prepared for us. Just to think you're not here by chance, but by God's choosing, his hand formed you, and he made you the person you are and compared you to no one else. You are one of a kind, you lack nothing. His grace can't give you. He has allowed you to be here at this time in history to fulfill a special purpose for this generation. Very nice words, but that can be said of all of us. Thank you, Pastor, for all you do. Uh, we're thankful for your ministry here. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to minister here, but along with you, okay? This is a team effort. Let's stand together. Let's sing. Praise him, praise him. Ron, I'm going to try to keep my head up so I don't rub that mic. Okay. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Now, we don't have Alice to play the piano today, and uh, I really miss her music, but that does a couple of things. One, that means I get to start it in whatever key I start singing in. It might be too low, it might be too high, but you guys stay with me. But also, I sing quickly. <laughs> I found that if you sing quickly, you don't have to have as much breath, okay? So stay with me. Here we go. Praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, Jesus the crucifixion. Sound his praise. Jesus, who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with Hosanna's ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Coming over the world victorious, power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, Tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. You may be seated. Turn now to 239, your light blue hymnal, Jesus is coming again. 239 in the light blue.
which gets up there a little high, so I'm going to try not to start at two. All right, here we go. Marvelous message we bring, glorious carol we sing, wonderful word of the King, Jesus is coming again, coming again, coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon, coming again. Coming again, oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. Forest and flower exclaim, mountain and meadow the same. All earth and heaven proclaim, Jesus is coming again. Sing, coming again. Coming again, maybe morning, maybe soon, maybe noon. Coming again, coming again. Oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming. Amen. Standing before him at last, trial and trouble all past, crowns at his feet we will cast, Jesus is coming again, coming again, coming again, maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. Coming again, coming again. Oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. Well, there'll be a wonderful day. We'll get to be reunited with our loved ones that we said goodbye to this past week. By the way, for the next uh, several months or years, nobody is allowed to die. <laughs> Song number 409, 409, let's sing, I know whom I have believed. If you know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior this morning, say amen. 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 All right. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known. Nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Aren't you glad? that he's able to keep you saved. Anybody ever given you something to, for safekeeping and you put it up and then several months later they come to you and they go, where's it at? And you go, I don't know, <laughs> but it's safe. You know what? I'm so glad that God's more organized than me and he can keep me saved. Second verse. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart. Nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating life in Him. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that He is able 
which are committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I'll walk the veil with him or meet him in the... Let me hear you sing it. great choir and it's nice to hear you sing that encouragement to me young people time to sing it's time to say some verses these guys are getting pretty good at quoting these verses and up here singing I'm, I'm just waiting for one of them to come up here and take an offering Song number 590, we're going to sing, This is the Day, This is the Day. <laughs> Are you ready to sing? You guys ready to sing? When you're singing, make, sure, make eye contact with those folks out there. Make sure that they're singing, okay? All right? Amen. They're watching you. They're watching you. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice, and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. Amen. Anybody have a memory verse today? You got a memory verse? And you got a memory verse? And you got a memory verse? Okay, is this a deal? It's a deal. Eleanor? Come over here and say your memory. Brother, this one. John eleven fourteen. Then said Jesus unto thee, Lazarus is dead. Amen. All right. Okay. Ephesians four twenty eight. Let that him stole fall. that still no more. Let him that stole still no more. Let him that stole still no more. I want to tell you something. That was sibling love right there. That eye contact, that was sibling love. Right? Let's stand up, go around, greet one another.
176, 176 leads me to Calvary. 176. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy horn-crowned brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thine love for me, lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels in robes of white arrayed guarded thee while thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thine love for me, lead me to Calvary. Let me like Mary through the gloom come with a gift to thee. Show to me now the empty tomb, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee, even thy cup of grief to share. Thou hast borne all for me, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thine love for me, lead me to Calvary. Stand with me now as we sing, Thou Art Worthy. We'll sing it through twice. He truly is worthy. Song number 73 in your hymns, if you need it. But he is worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our time. He's worthy of your focus this morning as we get into God's word. Be ready to meet with him. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created, hast all things created, Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created, for thou art worthy, O Lord. Do you love the Lord this morning? I do too. Let's sing it again. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy. To receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power. For thou hast created, hast all things created, thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created, for thou art worthy, O Lord. Amen.
said he is. Take your Bibles open to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We'll be in a familiar passage, but I'm going to try to start a series of messages on this. Um, I think a lot of times we're guilty of saying we know things, but we never learn how to practice them. We never learn how to make application in our own lives. Uh, and I'm trying to help us to gain our full awareness, being fully aware of what God's word is saying. Let's, let's go ahead and read. The Ephesians 6, chapter, chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the, in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Let's pray. Our Father, we bow before you at this time and acknowledge that we are unworthy. But you've made us worthy through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. God, uh, we're just feeble people, and at this time we are going to attempt to take your words and read them and allow your Holy Spirit to teach us and make application in our life. God, I pray that that is our prayer of every person here today. God, I pray that you'll bless this time. God, I pray for all the churches across Bakersfield and across America at this time and, and even the world that are preaching your true gospel message. I pray, Father, that souls would be saved, that lives would be changed because of the impact of your word on our lives. We pray to ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. We're called to fulfill three assignments that are essential for survival in spiritual warfare. And I want to try to talk about those this morning. But like I said, we're going to take our time going through this. There, there's, there's two or three different series of messages that I've been trying to get organized in my mind and ready to, to speak on, and this is one of them, um, and I just want to make sure that I do God's word justice. My aim in preaching and teaching from the Bible, while I like to have a good time, is not to be clever or entertaining, and then, of course, I think a lot of you would say, well, that you don't have to worry about that clever part, you know? Or entertaining, but you know, we like to have a good time in God's house. But my goal is to equip you, to help prepare you, to give you from the Word of God the tools that you need to, to fulfill the work that God intends to accomplish in you and in me. And this is on a daily basis, every day. I saw her looking at me a while ago. <laughs> so, as pastor, I'm called to equip the saints. Equip the saints. You got your equipment. You know, we'd play baseball, and, and uh, you'd have the coach, and the coach would grab the bat. Get the equipment bag. What is he saying? It had all the gloves in it. had all the bats in it. had the baseballs in it. And, and uh, well, that's the way it used to be. Now everybody's got their own equipment bag. They walk along, and they got this bag. They might have a bat worth four, five, six hundred dollars in there. Times have changed, folks. I remember going down to... Uh, I was a minor in Stockton, and it was Stockton Athletic, and walked in there, Adam, and it had this rack full of all these beautiful wood bats. Oh, they were great. And I reached in there, and I picked out an alkaline, line, 35-inch alkaline, line, because it had a nice thin handle. I digress, not part of the message. But I am called to equip the saints. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. You're close. You can turn there if you will. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. This is what he says. He says, Paul said, and he gave some apostles and some 
prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting or the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or maturing of the body of Christ. For how long? Till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now the Bible makes it clear that we have all that we need to accomplish all that God intends. Sometimes we sell ourselves short because we go, oh, well, you know, I can't do that. Well, you got all the tools there that you need to do it. Now, some of us, if we were to go out and, and build a house, we'd be a little bit better at it than others. But you got all the tools, and that's the point I'm making. You've got all the tools at your hand in God's word. The question is, why don't we see more evidences of the work of the ministry being accomplished? Why don't we see that happening? Why do we see believers at times uh, get sidetracked and uh, even at times they suddenly disappear and they just give up on ministry? The answer is because we have an enemy. We have an enemy who does not want us to do the work of ministry. That's because we are at war. Now currently there's a war going on in Russia and Ukraine. There's a war over in Israel against Hamas, Iran. Uh, there are battles going on in different countries and what have you. But spiritually speaking, child of God, we're at war. You are at war. So we need to ask the question, who's this enemy and what is his strategy? Most importantly, what has the Lord given us to enable us to fulfill this mission while we are under attack? While we're under attack. So being an able to answer these questions will help us to go far to understanding the work of the ministry. If we don't take to heart the message of Ephesians chapter 6, you need to understand you're in grave danger. You are, spiritually speaking, in grave danger because the war is going on against you whether you're warring back or not. If you neglect this message, it'll be just a matter of time before you're out on the sidelines or not, a, or not even able to be found. You know, we all know that there are fellow soldiers who were once in battle with us. Look around. Now, some have gone on to be with the Lord, and we celebrate their entrance to heaven. But there are some that used to sit in these pews that are no longer sitting in these pews. Where are they at? Where are they at? They're no longer in the fight. And if you're not careful... That'll happen to you as well. But it doesn't need to happen. Not if we take the heed the battle tactics God's word gives us in Ephesians chapter 6. And I need to say this, and I'll probably say it more than once. I don't fight, fight. You don't fight in your own power. We fight in the strength of God, and we've read that this morning, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. Back in 1655... There was a Puritan minister named William Gurnall, and he wrote a book called The Christian in Complete Armor. What a fantastic collection of writings he put together. Gurnall makes the point the saint's sleeping time is Satan's tempting time. Yeah, you say, well, I'm just going to take a little break here from what I'm doing. I'm, I, you know, I've been attending church, but... I want to get a little time for myself. I, and basically what you're saying, I, need, I want to do a little sleeping. Now, I'm not against anybody taking time off to rest. Jesus went away into the desert, and we certainly need a time to kind of refresh and all that. But we don't need to be just willy-nilly, I'm going to take time off this week because I don't want to 
be a Christian this week, <laughs> basically. All scripture is very important. All scripture deserves close and thorough investigation. And that's why I'm saying I'm anticipating being a few weeks here, okay? Being a few weeks here. I would encourage you to read Ephesians 6 every week, every day. Kind of drink it in. According to Ephesians 6, 10 through 13, we're called to fulfill three assignments that are essential for survival in spiritual warfare. As I prepare for this message, I, I read messages, I listen to guys online that preach that I uh, trust, and there's so many different ways you can come into and talk about this. I heard one preacher as he got into verse 10 here, he began to identify our enemy, the devil. And I may come back to that, the devil. He's called Lucifer in heaven, he's called the devil, he's called Satan, Beelzebub, the, the prince of the air. Goes by many names. And we need to know that there is an enemy. We cannot see. One preacher said, you might say, well, I've never seen a demon. And he said this, how do you know? How do you know? Well, it's quite a thought. But first thing we're called to do is we're called to rely. Rely. This is our first responsibility. Verse 10 begins finally. And obviously Paul is beginning a new and final subject in this letter. He's kind of wrapping it all together. I've said all these things here before. Now, finally, I'm drawing it to conclusion. I'm going to put a bow on it. I'm going to say this is what we need to be aware of. This is what we need to do. The readers of this letter were special people to him. About 10 years prior, the apostle evangelized and had started a church in Ephesus. Now, from a Roman prison, he's writing them this letter. He loved this people. He loved this people. His time of battle was coming close to to an end. In Ephesians, he taught about two great truths. Some uh, men break it up differently, but for us this morning, first as Christians, we have resor resources. And that's the first three chapters. It says, here are your resources. This is what you need. This is what you need to equip yourself with. This is what you have at your disposal. And second, as Christians, we have responsibilities. Chapters four through six. So I have resources and I have responsibilities. And the two go hand in hand. The Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. Those who are in Christ have great spiritual resources available to them. I'm talking about supernatural gifts that allow, allow you to have supernatural power in this world. I'm not talking like you can move a, a, a this podium from here over there without physically moving it. I'm talking about spiritual power. According to Ephesians 4, we're to live a life worthy of our calling. Are you living a life that's worthy of your calling? We're, we are to walk a certain way through life. We're to walk in unity in the church. And we're to walk in purity in the world. Are you doing that? Not only is that my responsibility, that's your responsibility. Everyone's responsibility. We're to walk under control of the spirit as reflected by our attitudes, by our family relationships, and by our relationships on the job. Talking about being under control of the spirit, which is one of the uh, series of messages that I'd like to bring. I heard an example, and it's talking about being filled with the Spirit. And he said that word filled is that like a nautical term. And, it's, and the idea is you have sails there, and these sails catch the wind. And you're filled with that wind. The flame aid, as he said, you cannot have a reserve of wind, but you open your sails. 
and you allow that spirit to fill those cells so that you be filled with the spirit. But there's one more subject on the Apostle Paul's mind. He said, finally, finally, we've come to the conclusion of Paul's letter. In some respects, what Paul says at the end sums up everything for us. What's the last thing Paul wants the Ephesian Christians to know? He said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Are you strong in the Lord and in the power of his might this morning? Warren Wiersbe reminds us that if we don't live for Christ on the playground, we don't live for Christ on the playground but we live for Christ on the battleground. There are a lot of frustrated, struggling Christians these days. They're not doing very well in the battle, and we need to ask why. Here's why we often don't. One, we forget or at least seem to be unaware that we're in a battle. We forget it, or we just are unaware of it. You know, I never had the honor and privilege of serving our country. As I look back and could have done some things differently, that would have been one of the things I'd done. I'd probably gone into the Corps, was my thought. I don't know, but they may have whipped me out of there. <laughs> but I have enormous respect for our military people. Those that have said, I will give my life to serve this country. I cannot imagine what it would be like to be under enemy fire. I know that we have some that have served in Vietnam here this morning. I've heard stories of friends talking about what they had gone through and how dangerous it was and the conditions. I don't know what it would be like to be keenly aware of that at any moment I'm in imposing danger. Something could happen to me. I, I, I may not see it. Somebody may be sneaking up behind me. And, but I'm in battle, but, but I'm very aware of it. That's what we need to be this morning. We need to be very aware that we're in a battle. I don't see the bullets flying overhead. I don't hear the tanks crashing through walls around us, spiritually speaking. So many times we forget and are spiritually unaware that the battle is going on around us. The battle is always going on around you. The battle is nonstop. Satan is not resting. Shortly after the presidential election in 1912, no, I, we're not old enough to remember that, Tim. <laughs> But in 1912, Woodrow Wilson had not seen his, had an aging aunt, he hadn't seen her for years. And the story is he went by to see her and he, she said, what are you doing these days, Woodrow? He said, well, I've just been elected president. She said, oh yeah? President of what? <laughs> Inquired the aunt. He said, of the United States. Don't be silly, she said. She was just totally unaware. Unaware. And that's the way we are. Brothers and sisters, we are at war. We need to write that down, put it on a piece of paper, stick it to the, to the magnet to the refrigerator, because I know all of us frequent that. Some of us more than others. But there are many ways to war today. You can be fired off upon by ship, bombed by a plane, there's missile attacks, there's cyber attacks. Uh, but at some point in time, all wars come down to, I've got to send in the troops. There's going to be hand-to-hand. -hand. We've got to clean it out. We've got to make sure that there's no enemy left that can attack. And that's what we're talking about this morning. You should be in a hand-to-hand, -hand, spiritually speaking, battle 
against Satan this morning. If we forget that we're in a battle, if we're unaware, then guess what? We will not be relying upon this armament of God. You will never rely upon God unless you acknowledge that you're in battle. How will this happen? Well, you won't make Bible reading a priority. I won't crack it. I won't look at it. You won't make church attendance a non-negotiable meeting time on your schedule. You won't pray before you go out the door every day. I mean, we get up, there's things that we do before we leave the house. We get dressed, we, we grab a bite to eat, and what, all these things. But folks, a word of prayer, meeting with God, is the most important thing you can do. If you don't do any of that, you're forgetting that you're in a battle. You're assuming that you can do it within your own power. And that's where we have a problem. Because in my own power, I cannot battle Satan. Now, God is all-powerful. And Satan to God, it's like, but Satan to me, if you were at the funeral last Monday, it's talking about heaven. It's talking about Wanda and seeing all the people. And one of the people I said that she got to see, she hears somebody running up behind her and it's, it's Melba. Now you know Melba had had her legs amputated. But Melba runs up to Wanda and hits her and, and almost knocks her down. That's Satan to me. He'll knock me down. Secondly, we fail, we fail to tap into our spiritual resources. I need to repeat, we have all that we need to live for God in this dangerous world. He didn't leave us without protection. He didn't leave us without a, a way to fight the spiritual fights we are in. But the fight is not in and of myself, it's in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, places in Christ. That's key, in Christ. So here's the key. Those who do well in the Christian life are those who tap into these spiritual resources. How, how does that person keep going and living the life of Christ and seems to have joy in his life and how is he able to do that he's tapped into the spiritual resources three we underestimate underestimate our enemy one of satan's strategies is to get people to believe that he doesn't exist we see it in cartoons and things and you'll you know as young people it used to be that we'd get the newspaper and they had a comic section section. How many remember the comic section? You have all these, you know, you have peanuts and different ones in there and you look at it and some were funny, some were kind of political and, and what have you. But every once in a while you'd see this guy in there and he's trying to make a decision that had to do with morality and he's got like an angel on this shoulder and he's got the devil on this shoulder and the devil has had the pitchfork and the pointed tail. And we did him an injustice because he's really real. But we act like he's not. But since we're Bible-believing people, and since he knows he can't get us to deny his existence, Satan takes a different approach. He gets us to underestimate him. I hear preachers every once in a while, you know, I got so fired up that I was ready to attack hell with a water pistol. That was good. But that's a lot of me. And that's not a lot of in Christ. So we forget, or at least we seem to forget, that we're unaware that we're in a battle. We fail to tap into our spiritual resources. 
and we underestimate our enemy. Here's what we need to do. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We must rely upon this. That is my source. Notice this. It's a verb. It says be strong. Literally it means be strengthened by the Lord. It's also in the present tense, meaning that this is a continuous process. I'm continually relying and allowing myself to be strong in the Lord, not in my power, but in his power. And that's vital because you will never survive the battle depending upon your own strength. Not for one moment. My younger brother, Jimmy Wayne, when I was worked out with weights, oh, he was strong, had 19 and a half inch biceps. Uh, we did not have an Olympic set of weights, so he just had the old 110 pound barbell set, but he had over 300 pounds on this bar, and it was literally bending. It would take him, he'd press it up, press it up. Oh, he was strong. I don't care if you're the strongest man in the world. You cannot battle Satan in your own power. Not for one moment. So on what or upon whom do we depend? Two-part answer. Two-part answer. One, we must rely on the Lord. It says be strong in the Lord. That is depend on a person. The Lord Jesus Christ. See, your Christianity is very personal. That's a lot of, a lot of people don't get and understand. Do you know the Lord? Yes, I know the Lord. When in reality, they know of the Lord, but they don't actually know the Lord. They never met the Lord. By faith, we have to enter into a personal relationship with Christ and then live by faith in constant dependence upon him. I am depending upon him to take me to heaven. The blood of Jesus Christ has made me clean. And because of that, I have a home in heaven, and I'm depending upon him to do that. But I need to depend upon him in my everyday life. I cannot do it in my own power, and that's where we mess up. We get up, we start out the day, we don't include God into our plans for the day. Well, you know what? I'm walking in my own power. In Christ. In Christ. Pay close attention to the next quote. Perhaps it will help you to identify your level of faith. Listen very closely to what I'm going to read. It's one sentence. It's a preacher by the name of Vance Havner. And I'm asking you, what's your faith like this morning? Well, you have faith in Jesus Christ, but your everyday faith, your everyday walk. This is what he said. A wife who is 85% faithful to her husband is not faithful at all. And it goes both ways. A wife who is 85% faithful to her husband is not faithful at all. There is no such thing as a part-time devotion to Jesus Christ. You're either devoted to him or you're not. So one, we must rely on the Lord. Rely on the Lord. We, we rely on him, his power. Two, we rely on his power. It says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Paul used three different Greek words here that communicate strength. Each reinforces the fact that we have resources that we need to survive the battle. It's imperative, very important, to get in our heart and our mind that God has provided us with all the power we need to win this battle. People that drop out of church and they just become overwhelmed, what happens? They've been fighting in their own power. They've been trying to do the battle themselves. Jordan doesn't work.
You ask just how much power is available to us. Well, go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I submit we've got quite a lot of power. Verse 20 says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave to him to be the head over all things to the church. We have at our disposal the same power God exercised when he raised Christ from the dead. Wow. So what's our responsibility? You, me, we need to rely on the Lord and on his power. By the way, this message is for the child of God today. If you're here and you do not know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, this, this message is not for you. You cannot depend upon him. It can be for you. He died for all men, not willing that any should perish, 2 Peter 3, 9, but that all should come to repentance. But in order to be a Christian, become a child of God, you have to quit relying upon your own faith, your own power, and put your faith and trust in him. Just as like the child of God on a daily basis, needs to put their faith and trust in this word to take you through life. If you do that, he'll set you free. He'll set you free. This, this is where it starts. Christian, if we're going to survive the battle, you, me, we all have to live a dependent life. And it's called relying upon God strength and his power. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for